Chapter 18 Amazing Reward Mr. Drew looked at his daughter, startled. Nancy, you may have guessed the answer. Call the house at once. Nancy did so. A woman answered the phone and said she was expecting her employer within the hour. Is a boy there waiting for him? Nancy asked. No, no boy is here. Thank you, Nancy said and hung up. She hurried back to her father and told him what she had learned. Dad, I want to go over there anyway and meet that man. Will you come along? Glad to. I want to hear his story and see if it jibes with that of Mrs. Allison. Twenty minutes later, the two set off. When they rang the bell of Mr. Tullock's home, a woman answered and said he had returned. I'm Mr. Drew, and this is my daughter Nancy, the lawyer said. We live here in River Heights and would like to speak with your employer. Step inside, the woman said. I'll tell him. Please sit down. As she disappeared up the stairway, the Drews had an opportunity to glance around. The furnishings were beautiful, and all of them apparently from India. It looks like a museum, Nancy whispered. What gorgeous ivory figurines and rugs! In a few moments, Mr. Tullock came down the stairs. His resemblance to Rishi was so startling, there was no doubt in the Drews' minds that he was the boy's real father. After greeting his visitors, he asked, You wish to speak with me? Mr. Drew nodded and said, Nancy will tell you. I hardly know how to begin, she admitted, but decided to plunge directly into the story. When your Rishi was a baby, you were told he had been killed by a tiger. This was not true. He was kidnapped. As she paused, Mr. Tullock leaned forward in his chair and gripped the sides. Yes, go on. Did you ever hear of a man named Rye? No. Or a Mrs. Allison? No. Mr. Drew spoke up. They are the culprits and also are guilty of starting a revolution in the community over which you held so much influence. You were driven from your country so that Ayama Togara could take your place. The wealth stolen from your estate was then used to elect him as governor of your province. Nancy found secret papers to prove this. The former Maharaja jumped from his chair. Is my son alive? he asked. We hope so, Nancy replied, then revealed what had happened to Rishi and how the Druze had become involved in the case. Mr. Tullock was speechless with surprise and dismay. Nancy's father told him the local police and the FBI were hunting for Rishi, Rye, and Mrs. Allison. We should have some word soon, he assured the boy's father as the Druze rose to leave. Mr. Tullock, We'll let you know the instant we hear anything about Rishi. Before Nancy said goodbye, she looked at Rishi's handsome but sad-looking father. I would like to tell you about a remark Rishi made. He said if he ever found you, he was to say Manohar to you. The man gave an exclamation in Hindi, then apologized and said in English, If I needed any proof you do know my son, this is it. Manohar was the name of the manager of my estate when I was a Maharaja. He was killed during the revolution. Mr. Tullock shook hands with the Druze and thanked them profusely. Then they left. The lawyer told Nancy he would go directly to his office, phone the bank, and instruct them not to let Mrs. Allison take the contents of the safe deposit box. Instead, they were to notify the police and hold her until they came. Nancy drove into town with him, said goodbye, and set off for home on foot. All day long, she restlessly waited for news, but none came. Toward evening, she decided to walk downtown and meet her father. I'll go by way of the park, she thought, turning into it. Her mind had reverted to Mrs. Allison. If she is around River Heights, what an ideal secluded spot it is. It could remind her of her burned house. And what an auspicious place to go into a trance. After a moment, the young detective smiled. It would probably be a little-used section of this park. I know the very place. 
Nancy headed for a densely wooded area. An old wooden footbridge crossed a deep, rushing stream. She paused, startled. Not twenty feet away, the figure of a woman loomed up. She wore a white turban, and the wind whipped her flowing robes about her wildly. As Nancy watched, the strange person approached the bridge railing. She stood there transfixed, gazing down intently into the angry water. That's Mrs. Allison! Nancy's body tensed at the thought. Is she going to jump in? The girl detective stole forward, being careful not to make a sound. The woman, unaware that anyone was approaching, stood motionless, still gazing moodily into the stream. What shall I do? Nancy wondered. She was tempted to run to Mrs. Allison, but reflected that Rye might be in the vicinity. She would be no physical match for the two, and they would certainly capture her. I must phone the police, Nancy reasoned. Stealing away quietly, she ran to the nearest street telephone booth and asked for Chief McGinnis. Nancy tersely revealed her information to him and was assured that men would be dispatched at once to the bridge. Maybe you'd better approach the place quietly, she warned. Otherwise, Mrs. Allison may be alarmed and try to escape. After completing the call, Nancy quickly returned to the bridge. Mrs. Allison had not moved. Greatly relieved, Nancy secreted herself in a clump of bushes nearby. I'll wait here for the police, she decided. The minutes dragged by slowly. Nancy grew worried and impatient. Then she heard the muffled sound of an engine. A car stopped some distance from the bridge. Apparently, Mrs. Allison had caught the faint hum. She glanced about alertly. Officers were moving stealthily along the footpath now. The woman turned as if to flee in the opposite direction. Nancy emerged from her hiding place to block the way. Mrs. Allison knew she was trapped. No, no, she cried out. The suspect wheeled and before anyone guessed her intention, climbed the high rail of the bridge. Stop! Stop! Nancy screamed, sure Mrs. Allison intended to make a dangerous jump. The woman poised on the rail for an instant. Then she plunged into the water. End of chapter 18 